Welcome, Asher. Good, almost Shabbos. Welcome, Nina. I wonder if you're the Nina that I know. Um, and welcome, Devorah. Welcome, welcome, Phyllis, and welcome, perhaps, Hello. Deborah's husband. Hi, Leon. Hi. Welcome. 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 <laughs> Um, I'm gonna tune us into some music, uh, a nigun from a, a dear, dear friend and teacher, um, Rabbi Matt Ponak, as we settle into this pre-Shabbos space um, and get ready to, uh, to learn and to this dive and exploration of what if. <sighs> it's not just God that is in search of humanity. But Adama is also searching and looking for us, Adam. That earth is also looking for humanity. Without further ado, a little melody. Oh, oh. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, 
It is so wonderful to see some familiar faces, beautiful faces, new faces, amazing pictures. Jeremy, I love all of your multiple eyes. Um, um, welcome, uh, Adam and Cora and Peter and Deborah and, and partner, Asher, Asha, Yaakov. Phyllis, um, welcome on behalf of the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest. Welcome uh, on behalf also of uh, my rabbinic school, uh, Hebrew College Rabbinic School that is hosting uh, or co-hosting this session. Um, it is a joy with you to, uh, to begin this exploration uh, of a question that has been floating around in my heart and my consciousness. Um, Maybe in some ways for about 15 years, um, more intensely for the last three years. Uh, coming out of uh, uh, our beloved teacher, familiar to, to at least some of you, uh, Rabbi Abraham uh, Joshua Heschel, uh, who wrote this amazing book, uh, reminding us that it is not only us humans who are <laughs> for God or for meaning in some sort of way, but perhaps God too is looking for us. And with that back book as, uh, as the background to, uh, to my relationship with God and with life in some sort of way, and a class uh, about 15 years ago on the, the very first Parsha of our Torah, uh, where my teacher Rabbi Yehoshua Karsh in uh, Chicago I don't know if any of you are from Chicago. Uh, Phyllis, fantastic. Oh, yes, David. Um, Sir Rabbi Yehoshua Karsh uh, taught at the Northbrook Learning Center. My guess is he's probably still there. Uh, amazing mensch and just like a beautiful, sweet soul. Um, he asked the most powerful question of, uh, why does humanity get named Adam? Uh, our Torah. Why, why is that the label that we get? Adam, of course, connected to Adama, meaning basically earthling. But how are we any more earthling than uh, anyone else? Everything else, uh, both according to the Torah and science as we know it, uh, comes from the earth. What makes us any more earthling than anyone else? So I'm just gonna let, uh, let that question simmer for you for a little bit. Um, and as it simmers, share just a uh, tiny bit more about myself and then invite you to share of what brings you here. Um, so let's see uh, how efficient I am in our electronics. Um, so, if you're looking for Rav Moshe, if you're thinking about Adama, which is really any class in, in, this, uh, in this big, bold climate fest, you're in the right place. Uh, I'm a founder of Water from the Rock, which is an eco-chaplaincy and an environmental education sprout uh, of an organization in Metro Detroit, Michigan, um, and a worldwide organization called Climate Change and Consciousness, which brings uh, indigenous teachers from around the world to help us connect with each other and to teachings that, uh, that are, I think are definitely trying to find us, that are waiting for us, that are yearning for us, that I think we very much need in order to bring healing at the kind of scale and with the kind of heart and with the kind of soul that we need. Um, and joining me is my partner in crime there, Ash Shope. Um, uh, she may be on or off video. Uh, now and again, hoping to uh, to keep uh, track of things uh, on chat, uh, helping keep me uh, focused, and also, God forbid, uh, if we should have any Zoom bombing, or I don't know if, uh, how many of you read to this fantastic uh, uh, new conspiracy theory that somehow we Jews have magic space rays, uh, if there are any magic space rays that come on Zoom, uh, and try to invite them in with compassion. Uh, <laughs> if anything should go wrong, 
um, we will indeed uh, ask them or boot them to leave. So um, with no further ado, um, just listened to a little bit of Matt Ponak uh, of the Nigun, and I invite you now to connect with uh, your part of the earth, uh, your goof, nefesh in Hebrew, soul and body are actually all one. Um, and feel into your physical body, feel into breath going in and out. You don't have to slow it down. Just notice it there. Feel into uh, your sit bones, your pelvis, your tukas. Uh, one of three Yiddish words that I know I apologize, but it's such a good one. Feel into your tukas, whatever it's sitting on, and just wiggle it around a little bit. Uh, and feel the whatever is underneath. Feel your shoulders, maybe roll them back a little bit. Stretch your neck to the right the left. Wiggle your fingers a little. Maybe feel whatever is underneath your fingertips. Amazing part of our goof that's super underappreciated. All the sensitivity of our fingertips. Next time you're outside, especially as it gets warm, let your fingertips caress some leaves, some flowers. Your fingertips are extraordinarily sensitive. And I invite you when you're ready, if your eyes are closed to open them and to uh, write into chat, what brings you today to this particular topic? Uh, it's wonderful if you know me and even more so if you love me, I appreciate it, but some reason other than that. Um, and what would you like to find by the end of our, uh, just about an hour left together? to give me a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, who's in the room, of what you're yearning for, what you're looking for. The two questions are, what brings you to this topic? Um, and what would you like to find to learn by the end of our hour together? So uh, I, I see from Adam, thank you for, for catching my humor about the wonderful space lasers on Mars. Um, um, Jody from Columbus, uh, Ohio says she's here uh, because she liked the title uh, and she's stealing her, uh, her daughter's machine. Uh, that's why it says Quora. Um, Jeremy, thank you. Exploring sources of Torah and Midrash for caring for the environment. Uh, Adam, your name looks so familiar, but I can't see everyone's face right now. Curious about the origin myths and to uh, explore your namesake. Uh, Asher, I've been thinking about how the earth has thoughts and desires and I'm curious to understand that better. Yaakov, uh, an old environmentalist always looking for more insights, your insights, stories, tools, ideas. Uh, Phyllis from Chicago, River Forest, uh, familiar. Um, yeah, just want to learn. Tasha, so good to see you. Looking forward to learning something new. Rabbi Nina Mizrahi from Chicago land. Uh, says she grew up in the woods and our sense of wonder and joy is nourished by her father, her blessed memory. It's your soul connection and she's looking forward to tech study. And the river, oh, so good to see you and thank you for, for joining Climate Change and Consciousness. Uh, and and more, more things here in chat that I will let folks read in their time. all for sharing. So I'm gonna come back to our teacher, uh, Reb Heschel. He points out to us something that, especially if we're in pain, 
especially we're struggling, we usually do not feel that we may be searching for something, whether or not we believe or experience some sort of God or godliness. When he says that, not just of his own belief, but from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, that God is looking for us. When Adam and Hava, they do whatever it is that they do with the tree of knowledge, and then they hide. God says, where are you? God says this not for a lack of geographical knowledge, of course. God says, ayaka, from a desire for us to be seen, um, even when we've screwed up, even when we feel uh, ashamed, even when we can't bear to be seen. And he continues to bring verses from Psalms, from the prophets, and speaks in his own amazing poetic languages. I think he knew probably seven languages. English was, was not at all his first, uh, and yet he writes more pointedly and beautifully in all of them than, than I do for sure. So he brings verses from the Psalms and others. God sweetly says in Psalm 27, for you, my heart says, seek me. That God begs for us to seek God out. And later in Isaiah, God says that I am ready to be found even by those who did not seek me. Here I am. Here I am. Even when we're lost even when we are far, even after generations and generations of exile, Hashel reminds us that Malachi speaks, maybe prays, perhaps Malachi prays that God prays, return to me, O children, and I will return to you. So my... Um, Oops. Um, my inquiry here is really an inquiry. I have to confess to you, I do not have a full answer. I do not have full sources that will clarify the nuances of our relationship with, with humans and our kin and the animal world and the tree world. But I wonder, and it's a question that I want to raise for all of our hearts and souls. What if it's not just God that is in search of humanity? What if the earth herself is also yearning and looking for us? Especially at this time of destruction and disruption and increased violence between humans, but of course increased destruction and disruption of entire species, entire ecosystems, and that's even before we get to the scale of disruption of climate change. What if the earth is also calling out for us and yearning for us? What would that mean for our lives? What would that mean for your life? If you felt the earth calling to you, what do you think she might say? What do you think she may be saying right now? And this brings me back to a teaching from uh, Rabbi Yehoshua Karsh that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. He asked uh, what I think is, uh, is an inquiry that is pointing to a missing commentary. Um, when the Adam, the, the human being in the beginning is looking for a partner in creation, right? And as some of you may, may remember, know better than I do, right? That, that the various animals come and, and it says he didn't find a partner fitting to him. Why did Adam did not look to the Adama as his partner?
None of the commentaries seem to even ask this question. They do ask what Adam means, and they break it down into Aluf Dam, that Adam means one who's Aluf, uh, who is uh, in control, is, is the master, director, uh, commander, general over one's Dam, meaning over one's uh, blood, meaning life force, or meaning Yetzer, like uh, energy. That a human being, a full human being, a realized human being is one who has control over how they direct their energies. But uh, the commentaries, as far as I've found, never ask, why does Adam never ask the Adama? And it's one of those questions like a, a, a Rashi question. If, you, if, if you're one of the other rabbis on here that I feel is, is begging to be asked because after all, Adam and Adama are natural partners. One is a conjugation of the other. Adam is the same word conjugated in the masculine, Adama in the feminine. Regardless of what our relationship is with the earth, regardless of our maybe modern awareness that other indigenous traditions certainly see us in intimate relationship with the earth, of earth as our mother or our sister, um, at the very least, our beloved partner. Um, the question is right there in the Hebrew. Why does Adam never look? And my painful read is uh, this is one of the things that either God and the Torah meant for us to be bothered by and to remember exactly at this point when we most need it, or perhaps with the same conclusion actually that in the generations of editing out of Judaism doing what every religion does, what actually every innovation does and science does too, uh, covering up and editing out the beliefs of previous generations, perhaps a kind of supersessionism within Judaism that cut out indigenous thought and indigenous understanding but nonetheless left us this blaring, blaring uh, gap of a clue just through the very basic knowledge of the Hebrew language. Why does Ha'adam, the, the human being, exact same letters, the He here just goes in the beginning, Adama, the He is here in the end. Why does the Adam never look for the earth? And I will share with you the answer that Rabbi Yehoshua Karsh gave us. So he said, when we name someone, we name them to highlight some special quantity, ju quality just to drive this home. You name your cat, your dog, your child. Some of us name cars or houses to highlight something, to remind you of something that's going to be special. But of course, human beings do not have a special relationship with the earth. So it says, Reb Karsh said to us, we do, but sort of in the inverse. Human beings are the only ones with the capacity to forget a relationship to the earth. That everything else lives in, you know, harmony or not harmony, right? Uh, animals, plants, uh, it's not a kumbaya natural world out there, you know. There are volcanoes, animals eat each other. It's brutal, it's violent. So it's not a kumbaya kind of harmony, but all the other animals uh, live in a kind of relationship that has a, at least a, a biological understanding that their life actually uh, is dependent upon the ecosystem in whatever way it is that animals and trees do into it and don't think. But human beings with all of our gigantic prefrontal cortexes, somehow we have had this capacity to forget. Perhaps this teaching, I wonder, is left in here for us like a sign, uh, like a black box, perhaps like tefillin, that some of us wrap around our arms, some of us forget to wrap around our arms, and here I'm pointing to myself and, and uh, more busy days than I would like. Perhaps this is a treasure for us. We are the only ones with the capacity.
capacity to forget. And this Adam Adama relationship comes to us specifically for this time, not as a proof text, but something to wake up our soul. That whatever our relationship with the earth, however we're recycling or not, or flying or not, however it is that we're acting politically or not, that it's not just a matter of protection or technology. There is perhaps some matter of intimacy, some matter of relationship. Now, I'm going to speak just a bit more and then take a pause and invite questions. Um, and I'm also remembering, uh, just before we started, Ash reminded me that I usually ask folks to interrupt, so you don't need to be on mute. Uh, human sounds, especially little human sounds, especially animal sounds, are very welcome all the time. Other sounds, if they're in the background, please mute. Um, and all, also, please uh, interrupt me in chat or out loud with thoughts and questions. I'm gonna do just this one slide and then take a real break. So everything that I am suggesting goes absolutely 100% against everything that I've been raised with. Uh, born in the Soviet Union, immigrated to the US when I was nine, uh, raised here more, mostly in the suburbs of Michigan, but Chicago, other places as well. And, and these things are uh, not necessarily so explicit, but they're in the background. So one is uh, what I'm calling on here, science versus scientism. That is, I think, in a background of uh, our cultural understandings. Uh, science is something I, well, I love or I hate, but uh, is super real and super useful. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, gives us extraordinary information, uh, understanding, connection. Uh, scientism is something different. Scientism, or there are other ways of referring to this extreme materialism, says that if we cannot measure it, to, if we today do not have uh, the gizmo to uh, somehow capture it, then it does not exist. Then it is not real. Meaning uh, uh, talking to people who live in another place or radio waves or x-rays and all of those things, they just did not somehow exist until we developed technology. Um, in order to utilize them. And of course, that's silly, but it's in the background, I think, of all of our consciousnesses that when we talk about relationship or, or, or actually speaking with, uh, with God or with the animals or with the tree or with the earth, well, that is definitely not possible because science has not yet measured it. And there's, of course, also the discussion which we can have that science is starting to measure and understand how trees and plants and animals and birds communicate with each other. Uh, and we can learn to understand and, and more and more science is coming out, but I wanna leave that actually on the shelf uh, for its own conversation and just point out what's in all of uh, the background of our consciousnesses. Even if we disagree with it, I know it still sits inside of my thoughts that this can't be real because I don't have uh, double blind placebo kinds of proof. And the second one is our dominion and stewardship models, uh, which uh, Judaism uh, and perhaps Christianity rightfully or not rightfully blamed for. Uh, a certain interpretation of Genesis 1 in several places, not just where I have it here, uh, that God told us to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. Uh, and of course, this also can mean many different things. There are commentators who say to rule uh, means to rule benevolently, um, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, can, uh, we can make it softer, but nonetheless, whatever it does or doesn't mean, this is a model, a way of living uh, that our society is founded on, wherever it is that it comes from. And another one, which uh, most uh, environmental circles really lift up. Um, and I also love and see with some skepticism. It's what we might call the stewardship model, which comes from Genesis 2.15. It says, and God took the human and God placed him, them, in the Garden of Eden to work its, actually probably says to work her, yeah. 
Deha to work her and to guard her. And in English, we come to call this stewardship, which is much better than dominion. But I also want to plant another seed. Do we steward those whom we love? What kind of a hierarchy of relationship does stewardship imply? And we do steward children, students perhaps at times. And yet it also implies a way of relating to the earth, of us somehow being at a place with more knowledge, which is clearly true in terms of the prefrontal cortex. But in so many ways, our prefrontal cortex has led us to a place in the history of this earth where we're responsible for destruction on a scale of no other species. As far as I know, so feel free to correct me. I'm wondering, perhaps there was a stage where, where a certain kind of bacteria took over to produce oxygen in the first place that completely terraformed the earth uh, and killed what was here before and then made it possible to live for everything else. Um, but I'm asking this as not intellectually, but emotionally. Where has our sehel, our intellect, our ability to uh, either have dominion or stewardship, where has it brought us? And here I'm going to pause. What might it mean if we stepped away, not we, as in the second person, what might it mean for you in your life if you were able to step through or away from either dominion or stewardship? What would it mean if the earth and by earth, you know, I, I can't help it, but I'm using it interchangeably as I think we often do in culture to imply earth as herself and also earth as a as a as a stand-in from all the life on the earth not just human beings what might it mean if the earth too is alive for you and is seeking you out i guess maybe an easier way of asking that or a way to start that conversation is how might you feel what emotions, sensations come up for you as you consider the possibility that just like Heschel said about God, that God and earth, Adama, is seeking us out specifically at this moment in time. I'm going to put myself on mute now to make it explicit that I am going to shut up. And I would love to hear half-baked thoughts, one-word expressions for our uh, folks to share what is coming up in their hearts and souls. I have a thought. I mean, the feeling you asked about I can relate to immediately because when I'm in nature, I usually feel better than when I'm around people, but that's me. Um, the thought I had that I never had before was what you were talking about, science and the dominion and stewardship models. It occurred to me a problem with Judaism that I never thought about. Judaism is a religion that talks a lot about separation. We separate normal days from holy days. We separate impure foods from pure foods. We separate Jews from the rest of people. We've always done that. And we separate ourselves from nature. And the thing that what you're talking about is, um, I don't think the earth is looking for us because that would mean we're somewhere else. To me, we're part of it. We're not somewhere else. And the problem is getting it across to people that we're not separate. 
just because we have these ideas and the prefrontal cor you know, uh, cortex that allows us to think you know, our way into problems so much, we're still part of it. It's just that simple. And, but it's a giant step from where most of the world is. Mm. Well, one thing I was thinking that there's a third relationship that's in Genesis. And that is man's having been, or humans having been created in God's image. God is a generative power. And so rather than just dominion and stewardship, maybe we have a responsibility um, to uh, continue the generative um, power, the generative experience. I don't know what it means, but I think it's something different from either stewardship, um, looking over something to which is inferior and for, for which we're caring, or um, kiboshing, you know, <laughs> Um, nature that that's the Hebrew <laughs> for subdue. Um, um, so I think there's something else that's possible, a different relationship that's maybe creative, but I like the word generative. Yeah. Mm. For, for me, you asked the question, and for me, it's sensation. Um, I, I think. I can describe how I feel when I'm in, say, I Wadi Rum it, in Jordan was just, it's so deep in me, a kind of silence, a kind of something where, where it was as if time stopped or this was all of time. And, um, and the feel of literally touching touching the earth and the excitement. And again, I know it, it's, it's kind of silly, but for me, this is the foundation of who I am. So when every spring, early spring, my father would walk with me around the property and notice the trees. He asked the question, how did they make it through winter? So it's a kind of, it's a kind of, that, that's a relationship when I really see and I'm wondering how it experienced a particular season. Um, it's very is very profound um, for me. And I, you know, I thought a lot about when I was working with some early childhood kids. Is you know they're writing about nature deficit disorder. You know there is such a thing for for people who are bereft. They don't have that generativity. Um, and it's something we should be concerned about. And I think that it's a safe relationship and it really lays the foundation to grow and develop one's compassion and carry that over to human beings. Um, I, I am a better person because of my relationship with the earth. Yeah, so powerful. I'm really uh, working on keeping my tongue in my mouth so that uh, because everything everyone is sharing is so um, profound is not the right word. Profound feels like out there, um, <laughs> uh, intimate. Um, uh, I invite folks that haven't spoken yet to share or. Um, for folks who wrote in chat, if you want to put things out, say things out loud. I see Jeremy um, shared something about uh, the feeling of uh, interconnectedness. Um, someone else uh, brought up the Tzalem Elohim and God's image and how that relates to, to our experience here. No one wants to put their, their thoughts and written words into voice. Uh, I invite you to do that. One or two more folks to share. And then I'll continue on with the slides. Jeremy. Well, we can't hear you, even though you're not. There you go. I, I, um, I, I, um, 
put some things in the chat, um, uh, references that some of you may take a look at. Um, one from Psalm 24, which I'm sure you all know, and, and that famous story about uh, the sage Khoni. Um, I learned something yesterday, which was very powerful, um, and I want to sh quickly share it. Um, it. It was actually on one of these other meetings. There's the famous story, um, and I, some of you may know my work. I'm a filmmaker. I made the movie The Chosen and from Chaim Podek's book. And there's a moment um, where the young boy is challenged with his famous line, if you are studying and you are distracted by a tree, you've lost everything. And what was fascinating was apparently one of the uh, people online yesterday, and you may all know this, I did not, that there's commentary on that. And the commentary is that if you do not recognize in that tree that that's where Hashem exists as well, then you have missed. But it isn't that because you looked at the tree and weren't studying whatever Torah you were studying at this moment, you've lost. It's that you didn't realize at that moment that that, to that tree is Torah just as much as words are. And I thought, oh, I was very appreciative of that moment. Yeah, that the that midrash uh, transformed this particular teaching, which I have done a battle with for for years. Uh, yeah, so I appreciate that, and uh, and also want to welcome Howard. Totally fine to join, or maybe two Howards. Or Howard, we see you in two places. Same Howard, double how du double same Howard. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, this, I mean, this uh, distraction, what role does that play in uh, this over busy, hyper busy life? Uh, it feels connected for me to, uh, to a comment from in the very beginning. I, I wrote down what people said, but not their names. I apologize how Judaism is so much about uh, separation. Uh, and this model of seeking, yeah, Yaakov implies separation, but perhaps the issue is that there is no separation, right? Not just spiritually or mythologically, but practically, physically. We know this in language, and you, you may have heard this from, from other teachers, that in biblical Hebrew, there is no word for nature. The word teva is a later rabbinic invention, because the word nature implies that there is a nature that is not human, and there are humans that are outside of nature. So maybe, uh, indeed, uh, my question is not the right one. Um, and there is no seeking, there is a feeling and a knowing of the kind of way that you described, Nina, of a, this felt sense that you've, um, that's been intimate for you since you were a child with your father and, um, and with trees. Um, <sighs> May I ask? I I, it, it's puzzled me throughout the um, sessions I've been at, everyone talks about overcoming the separation. And yet we have a concept of um, a whole, a shalem, a, a unity that we're supposed to relate to. So what if we simply start our day or our puzzle about don't approach this question framed as how do we overcome separation? but how do we acknowledge and realize our part of the whole? If we made that the frame of our days, what would that do? Yeah, Peter, I, I think what your point, your, oh, I'm sorry, um, Bambi or someone else going to speak? No, wanted to respond? No, I wanted to respond to the question yeah. that was just yeah. asked. Yeah, please. Um, it's not about me, so I feel <laughs> it's nice when things aren't about oneself, but it's. A, I would like to speak about my daughter. Yeah. Um, I have a, th a 39, and I'm looking at the backdrops. I don't know what Jeremy's real backdrop is. <laughs> I like his, <laughs> his would be one. Um, but the rest of us are all seated in our homes with four walls. And I have a daughter who went to a Native American camp. Well, both of our daughters did um, when she was very young and learned how to live in the woods. She was maybe eight or nine years old when that started. She went on and studied a little mind body in high school. Went on and learned, had her college learning, very successfully, very academic, but 
learned all kinds of other ways of being, which is what she started learning when she was eight or nine years old. And she's now living in the Arizona desert. Um, they have a tiny bit of a garden. They live off the land as much as they can. Somebody goes into town and gets other kinds of food. Um, she lives what, every time she calls me. She is, you can feel, the, hear the crunch of the desert as she's walking the desert. She knows the desert. She can find her way and orient herself everywhere. Every, she's living in love. She's mm. living a life of love like nobody else I've ever read about or heard about. But those of us who live in our four walls or multiple walls, you know, walls within walls are walled off from that true experience. So, you know, she's 39. She's been, she tried it out a couple of years ago, went back to her more quotidian life and gives away her money that she saved and fathoms, she says the world universe provides and she lives with no worry, no fear, no anxiety. Um, wow. I've been seeing her develop in this way for many years, but I never imagined it would reach these heights and these depths. Mm. And so while most of us here might be a little too old <laughs> to switch our lives around, she's, you know, grew up exposed to all of this. Um, she's other, many other sources of the richness of her life, but her life is about relationship and whether it's her relationship with God or her relationship with other human beings and her relationship with the earth. And there's no domination and there's no need to learn about these different pieces. It's all integral. So mm. I say that not as a, I just say that to say it can exist, but you have to allow it. That's mm. Mm. Thank you, Bambi, for sharing, um, not just because it's sharing from your life, but because it's a, it's a sharing of that this is possible. This isn't something that like is mystical and far away. Uh, this is something that, that people that some of us know um, live in uh, in different kinds of ways. Uh, I'm sure in imperfect ways. I'm sure that there. I, or I'm not sure. I imagine there are days when she doesn't uh, feel completely at peace. There may be days where she's terrified, uh, or at least that may be the case for the rest of us uh, <laughs> if we move towards that kind of life. Um, and at the same time, I think this issue of your relationship is for at least me is also a response to Peter, I think your question of is everyone talks about disconnection um, and, and maybe the issue is not disconnection, but, but how connected we are. And, and I use the word relationship instead of connection because connection is sort of like a philosophical term, uh, but relationship is a real life, real, real life term. So perhaps indeed the issue is, regardless of what we believe, uh, how do we nurture a relationship with the earth and with their other kin, animals, and trees? And when I say kin, I'm also not being metaphorical. I mean, literally, biologically, as you know, we all uh, have learned in, in recent decades of genetics, uh, right, that we share, you know, what is it, 64% of our DNA with a fruit fly or something ridiculous like that. Um, so literally relationship with our kin, which then goes beyond having the right technology. And also is close to my heart and, um, and I teach and, uh, and plant uh, seeds of for other folks because perhaps regardless of where we do or don't get to with other aspects of climate action, while they are absolutely vital, I am 100% in support with a, uh, of a green technological revolution. I'm 100% in support of a political transformation. I'm 100% in support of a climate justice transformation. At the same time, regardless of where we do or don't get with that, and regardless of what calamities uh, we face as individuals, as families, as communities in the coming years, because this is not far away. Um, regardless of disruptions that we may see on the scale of the pandemic or worse in the coming decades, 
what if in the midst of that we are nurturing in ourselves or even falling into or experimenting even even while our prefrontal cortex or even our kishka say this is nonsense baloney spiritual new agey hippie mumbo jumbo uh, maybe it's not so loud in your mind as it is in mine um but what if as that's going on we can do what i've learned from my buddhist friends which is like smile you know like at those ideas like hey buddy good to see you <laughs> we've been friends for a long 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 time often also not friends and what if at the same time we turn it to uh bite-sized pieces just like one percent more uh of what bambi's daughter is talking about what indigenous folks from around the world have always done and struggled to do under colonization what our own ancestors indigenous ancestors have stri uh, tried to do and and some of our families have maintained small pieces of that though it's very very difficult uh in an industrial world and in a colonized world but what if we lean just one percent more into the possibility of there being a relationship not metaphysical not as an idea space but a felt sense the way that nina was describing um and an actual conversation so with that, I'm going to bring us just a few more sources because time is is moving with the clock and and not at uh, at the pace of the trees growing as I would like, or even the boulders, which would take us in a completely different time frame. And we are moving into Shabbos, which is the Jewish version of there is no more time, or we're in a special time or an interconnected time or we get an extra soul, or our soul receives an extra bit of creativity or sensitivity, or maybe just a, a sense. Some of our mystics speak of uh, the besamim, uh, the uh, spices that Ashkenazim, we smell just at the end of Shabbat, but the Sephardim smell at the start of Shabbat and the end of Shabbat as well. Perhaps that just that little scent the mystics talk about this as being like the scent of a scent of Gan Eden of the Garden of Eden, uh, inviting us to to just just lean into that, to to open up our nostrils, um, and uh, and let our soul and our sechel, our mind, take in these few next texts. All right, so I'm going to go back to screen share, and we'll do what all of my great teachers do, which is never gets through even half of the things planned, which is fantastic. Um, because especially on this topic, there is nothing that anyone can say that's going to be more powerful than our conversation, than our letting ourselves feel into what might it be if the rest of the world was alive. So for those, that part of our brain that wants some proof texts, uh, you can uh, you know do a Google search for this. Um, I will post this somewhere you'll receive a recording of these but our torah as much as it may have erased the answers to some of our indigenous earth relating questions does speak of all of creation having a soul from the very beginning uh of genesis um where uh god speak and says let the earth bring forth living souls uh, i think nefesh hayim or some conjugation of that according to its kind. And it's the same expression, whatever the Hebrew is there, first the cattle creeping things, wild beasts, and also relating to humans. And we have lots of other places where the earth is animate, um, oftentimes in a destructive sense, they're in response to the things that human beings do in Leviticus, uh, regardless whether we agree with the content of Leviticus, uh, but the earth, God says that the earth will spew us out uh, and do so actively um, when we do not follow um, healthy, constructive ways. Korach's uh, rebellion in numbers here, this is the second source, the earth opens her mouth. Now, what this means, practically speaking, 
I think is not so important. I think this whole question of what do things literally mean is a modern Christian question. And I get this sense because when I read the Jewish sources, I see something that I love and I want everywhere in my life, but even so, I, I, I still am not great approximating. And that is all the commentaries disagree with each other, but still stay on the same page. And maybe even in some ways across the room, in the same room or across the room and across generations, our ancestors were somehow not bothered with the question of what this literally means. They were somehow comfortable with uh, not just the diversity of opinions, but with reading scripture and sacred text and feeling its power and its potential in a way that words can only approximate. One of the more powerful versions of this uh, that I've read is from Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, eighth century text, says there are six kinds of voices that uh, scream and cry out from one end of the universe to the other. And here I have an excerpt of just one of those, that when a fruit bearing tree is cut down, her voice, just like a human voice, cries out from one end of the world to another. And, or maybe it should be, but its sound is not audible. I think here the teaching is pointing to that when we, when we say, or we imply, and indigenous folks say and imply that the earth is animate and alive, that they can speak to the animals and to the trees, they're not being pre-scientific or unscientific or silly or stupid. They know that words are not happening in the way that human beings use words. But there can be cries, there can be conversation, there can definitely, according to our tradition, and always is song, and there are cries. And of course, we have many ver other verses in, in Psalms, and those of us that are joining services uh, uh, after this workshop or do other Friday nights or, or many Saturday mornings or other mornings when we sing the Psalms, they're full of expressions like the heavens will rejoice and the earth will sing, the sea will roar and everything that is in him. And I wrote him meaning it's animate. She or he is animate. And the Rambam writes of this, though of course there's great debate of what he means by what he means. Uh, coming from uh, 13th century France, Spain, Egypt, other places in the, in the Arab world, writes that all stars and spheres, and by that he means, uh, uh, he means uh, heavenly bodies, what they would say, possess souls, intellect, and understanding. And they are alive, exist, and recognize their creator. And I bring these as a part of a silly play for the part of us that wants textual, uh, concrete knowledge um, or a serious play. But I don't bring these sources so that we can sit and we can decipher, well, how do they know? How do they feel? I, I bring them as seeds of what if, um, as my teachers uh, in, in Israel at the uh, uh, Pardes Institute often reprimanded me when I argued and uh, I'll have to admit, swore uh, at various misogynistic uh, things in our uh, violence, things in our tradition. I would say, Moisha, you can disagree, but you have to do so respectfully. And from him saying this uh, over and over and over again, well, it brought me to this place of, what if I read our tradition with the following question in mind? If there is some deeper wisdom in this, what might it be? And I'm going to repeat it. So it's the question that I bring to anything and everything that I teach, which helps me remember to ask it as opposed to the other questions. If there was, this is not like an existential question. This is not to prove something. It's not about our belief in the sanctity or, you know, or where the Torah came from but for the purpose of our soul's growth, as someone said that, uh, uh, that God is generative in, in creation in uh, the book of Genesis, and perhaps we too can be generative and creative in this way. So for our creativity, what might it mean if 
these things practically, not intellectually, not philosophically? How might your heart respond? What might you physically uh, do if this is true in some way? If there is some wisdom, some reality to the earth being alive and having a soul, as, as someone pointed out, what if our disconnection or lack of relationship to the rest of our kin is why we feel so alone, is why we have what's called nature deficit disorder. But I think that's, it's a subcategory of the bigger aliveness around us that culture and trauma has cut us off from over and over again. What if we find just some small 1% more way of connecting to our kin? And I'll share, I do a crazy thing uh, when it's, uh, there isn't snow on the ground, is, is I lie down. You don't, I'm not saying you have to do this. This is this just, you can't, you don't have to. Uh, I lie face down. Um, and I try to hug the earth. And I let myself, my, from my fingertips to my heart, feel what it's like to be physically held up by the earth. What might you do? What might you feel if we are not the only ones who are breathing and feeling and yearning here on this planet? So of course we couldn't have this discussion with a little bit of Reb Nachman. Um, so he, uh, a, few, uh, a few excerpts from him here says, know that when a person prays in the field, all the grasses come together and give strength to them into prayer. This is what it means when it says Isaac went out to pray in the field, the Hebrew lasuach basadeh, and Reb Nachman does what our tradition does. He reads this generatively, meaning on all the levels and engages in the, this word play because the uh, uh, the word for um, grass or plants here can also mean to converse. Uh, so I wrote in different ways that he writes, he went out to grass with the grasses, to plants with the plants, or to converse with those conversing. Perhaps there is some way in which we can do this, whether it's walking or it's laying down or it's touching the leaves and the flowers with our fingertips. What, in what way can we grass with the grasses, flower with the flowers, be with the bees? <laughs> and then he continues um, that from the edges of the earth, we hear songs, songs and nigundim, wordless melodies. They come out from the grasses in the field. Again, here pointing in another creative use of language that the, that the writer and his students and his family, they're not pre-scientific, they're not barbarian, indigenous, backwards, small village people who do not understand that and or somehow have fantasies or, or, or stories that the earth talks and think it opens its, uh, her mouth uh, and don't realize that it doesn't actually do that. So this is why he uses so much metaphor here and the metaphor and then the use of nigunim, perhaps the earth and the bees communicate with us, but with nigun, which are wordless melodies, with energy, with feeling. And of course we can bring science that the earth is putting out energy and the bees are putting out energy. And if that supports you, Baruch Hashem, um, if you just feel it in your heart, where you feel like you can smell it or, or have like a scent of a scent, which is my experience or yearning of a yearning that there's something here calling me worth. As we come to a close, I'm gonna give us a little Rav Cook in a moment, but I couldn't do that without another, uh, another central part of our tradition, which I'm, this you probably have heard in other classes, um, in other workshops, but I just want to bring it to mind again because we 
we started from the verses of Genesis of what kind of relationship and models do we have of uh, between humanity and the earth. So Genesis 2.15, which is our stewardship model, usually gets translated as uh, something like God told them to uh, work and protect the earth or sometimes till and protect the earth. Uh, and it uses uh, the shorsh, the roots, uh, ayin bet dalid, which has this, well, I guess a quadruplet. I forgot to put till in here. Uh, it's a very rare use. I think this may be one or two places uh, in the entire Tanakh where avad means the till. Um, but it frequently has these three very different meanings. And I think they're actually all interconnected and they're partly our choice and partly a function of the society that we live in. So Avad, most commonly, well, I don't know most commonly, all three are very common. In Genesis and Exodus, we have them over and over again. It can mean to work, meaning there's some agency, there's some choice. It can mean to serve, meaning a sense of, uh, of reverence, uh, of, uh, of care, um, of perhaps intimacy or, 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 or a care that is, that is just something that's so beyond that we don't know how to be intimate to. And it can also mean to be enslaved. It's the same word that gets used in terms of our experience of slavery in Egypt. It's the same word that gets used in terms of laws about having slaves afterwards and laws about not having slaves afterwards right so our, so our tradition is full of the complexity of mishigas and destruction and beauty um and i think uh these meanings are central in terms of our possibility really to most things in life including what we do to earn money uh to some extent and certainly in our relationship to the earth to what extent is is uh, living on the earth uh, like Bambi's uh, daughter? Um, does it feel like hard work, like like painful work? Uh, I think the Genesis and uh, other places talk about this being extraordinarily painful, and there being thistles and and other things and blood and sweat. To what extent is it so painful and it's so destructive? It feels like enslavement. Uh, feels like abuse either to ourselves because of what we have to do in order to survive on the earth. And certainly in terms of our, the, the way that we're using and abusing the ecosystems and other living beings around us. And to what extent does it feel like service? And not service that we do because we're trying to be good. Forget even looking good, but you know, that internal thing that we all have, that we wanna think of ourselves as good people. Um, but, you know, I wish that I could even substitute the word intimacy here. In what way does it feel like intimacy? Uh, and we do have that connection in Judaism. The, uh, the things that get called sacrifices that the Israelites bring uh, to the temple, korbanot, uh, lahakriv, uh, a korban, literally also is a thing that is something that is near. Uh, so, so most literally, we might say, that the people are bringing near offerings. And, and for that, certainly is something that perhaps can be intimacy. And I have, I think, one last slide, and I will again uh, open up. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. I, this is a piece from uh, Rav Cook, who's, uh, eight, uh, let's see, 19, 20th century. Um, uh, perhaps Poland, other folks, I apologize, correct me, Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, um, comes to Israel and has this abil amazing ability to build relationship uh, across Jews who are religious or not religious, uh, across Jews and Arabs and Christians uh, with people, uh, modern folks uh, and traditionally religious folks and not just for some constructive purpose, this thing that Rav Kirk does that's amazing, is he actually sees the goodness in what the other group is doing. So when he is talking about the, the Israeli secular pioneers, the ones that actually built 
uh, the country physically. He says this thing that they're doing with the land, the actual working of the land, that's the gathering of the sparks. That's, that's what's making it possible to come back here. That is the healing work of the earth. That is generative work. We need to learn from them. Of course, there are other political things that were very destructive that were happening that he either did not speak to or, or I have not read. Um, but he had a capacity to relate that is uh, extraordinary for his time. It would be extraordinary for our time. So here is a piece that he writes. All existence whispers to me a secret. I have life to offer. Take it, take it. There's a word play here. I might say, join me or even marry me. Connect with me. Come intimately close with me. If you have a heart, and in that heart, red blood courses, which the poison of despair has not yet soiled. But if your heart is dull, existence whispers, and if beauty does not charm me, leave me, leave me be. And then he continues, that a come will time when the generation will arise full of life, and sing to beauty, to harmony, and to life, and draw delights unending from the dew of heaven. And this people, God willing, this may be us, and even those that we cannot imagine possibly thinking or feeling this way, even those that we see as somehow the other. I pray this is this will be all of us just 1% more in these coming days and years. We will open to the unending delights, to the dew of heaven, and that we'll return to life and we will hear the wealth of life's secrets from the vistas of the Carmel and the Sharon. We'll be open to the delights of song and to life's beauty and harmony. And then we'll be filled with a sacred light, something that is not physical or is beyond the physical, perhaps the energy of the Big Bang of creation itself, perhaps that and something even more profound. And with that light, our heart open to it, perhaps we'll be able to hear the whisper of existence that says, my beloved, I am yours. My beloved, I am yours. My beloved, I am yours. So I'll end with this. And now what if in the two minutes or however long you want to stay, but a practical what if for you that we started out with. How would your life be different? If you knew, if you felt that the earth, that existence is searching and calling out for you, reaching for your fingertips, or maybe they're just like a scent, something that is ephemeral but actually goes inside of us. The visceral knowing that we are not alone, that while we may feel lonely and be in extraordinary pain and in suffering, that while those things are very real and nothing can perhaps, no words at least can negate them, and at the same time, you could feel or sense some kind of intimacy. The kind that we see here in the picture, it's on the bottom of my screen of Ruthlyn Mulberg. Or every other kind of intimacy, the kind we see in the picture of Jenna Ha, the flower. 
How would your life be different? What might you do to move just 1% more to responding to the intimacy and the living? Uh, I invite you to unmute yourself, uh, to a Shabbat Shalom, uh, to any sharing. I will stay on as well as wave goodbye to everyone as you transition to whatever uh, life brings next. But at the very least, unmute yourself and give us a Shabbat Shalom or good Shabbos. Good Shalom. Good Shabbos. Good Shalom. Thank you. Good Shalom. 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 Good Tell me what you find, because as I shared in the beginning and is just as true now, I bring the, this as an inquiry that is pulling at me. Um, and I'm struggling uh, to put into words. Um, but it's pulling, like I said, like a scent. This is the best metaphor that I have. Ephemeral, but actually deeply inside. You made Shabbat. me think about how whenever I see a rose, I, I gravitate to the rose. There's a certain things in nature. I think it's one of the most perfect things in nature because it, all the senses are involved. But what you're talking about, I came a little late, but I went to another one about Adam earlier. I'm late, sorry, because I got stuck in perfect. The, there's a lot Albert of great is. stuff going on here. It's perfect. But ultimately, tying it to the whole idea of being stewards of the earth and being with the earth, it's being on that tangent of being satient physical beings and yet knowing ultimately our consciousness and all that is part of the, 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 whole, the whole thing, you know? It's, we're, we're atomized into these supposedly distinctive essences that's part of this whole thing. And it's really even hard to put in words, you know? I said, one of those great epiphanies I had around the college dining table was, oh, language is a representation of experience. It can never be the experience itself. So that's the, one of the closest things as human beings, besides touching that we use to try to have a common experience and we can't totally do it. So this is as close as we get, but I, I think what you're talking about, even you know, grabbing the earth, the tree huggers, all of that kind of plays into probably subconscious natural inclinations to, to embrace where we came from, from that wholeness. Does that make yeah. any sense? I don't know. It, well, whether it makes sense or not, I'm gonna, <clears throat> it, it does make sense. And I also want to, you know, put that on a wonderful shelf that you can come to back to anytime you want because it's real for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it makes me think of a, another teaching from Heschel where he says that the Torah is a midrash on the people's experience of Mount Sinai. What was experienced, as you're saying, is not something that could be put into words. Um, that whatever we have written, even if it's the most ancient thing, at best, it's a midrash. Uh, and he's probably pulling from a much older teaching, which questions what we actually heard at Mount Sinai, right? Like, especially the parts in the Torah that happened before Mount Sinai. We, did we hear them again? Did we learn? Okay, all of this intellectual game. But it, uh, but it eventually comes to a really sweet place. So they come to, maybe they heard just the 10 commandments. And then someone says, without shooting anyone, I disagree. Maybe just the first commandment of, uh, I am the Lord, your God. And someone else says, with disagreeing, but without you know using any mean names. No, just the first word, I, which in mm -hmm. here is Anohi. And another person comes, not even that, says they heard the Aleph, <clears throat> which is silent. And then they became the Aleph. <laughs> but then you're, you're almost speaking to then, that also speaks to the idea that 
again, then we were all there. It's us, we were the ones who were at Mount Sinai. So that's why it's a living Mishnah. Yeah, and not and just it, us. It resonates. I, yeah, I think our four-legged friends, River, thank you. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, at least I the hope. The thing is, where, where I lose it is, I don't like ants or roaches in my house. I feel like there's enough room for them outside. I know that's a culture, it's an acculturation hey, that even you know, that is, you know, but. <laughs> even the Dalai Lama, and I, and I heard him, I heard a recording of him actually saying this. He said about, I heard him say about the mosquitoes. He says, the first, mos well, he says this, you know, in a very deep way, but something like the first mosquito, okay. <laughs> it was an offering. <laughs> so you know we got to. It's we. You know I'm with you for respecting them, but also they need to respect us. Which you know, like. But I also think evolutionary. That's the reason why all these some of these other species are are are, are birthed in in big bunches. You know. <laughs> yeah. Good night, Fred. but not goodbye. I hope. Not goodbye. I'll stay in touch somehow. Yeah, I'd love that, Peter. I have a question for Peter. Is that the universe behind you? Oh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. It, a friend of mine painted it, and it, yeah. they are like stars in the sky. Yeah, um, so I was all the time you were talking, I was feeling you in the universe. This whole thing is worth it just for that question right there. <laughs> Thank you all. This Shabbat shalom. Really meaningful. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Bye bye. Shabbat shalom. Bye. All right. Thank you, everyone. So, if yeah. you ever know anybody, a young person who might like that kind of experience that my daughters had when yeah. they were young, the name of the place is called. It's a wonderful story. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I found it. Yeah. Hawk Circle. At the and, time, and it's in New York, just kind of over the oh. Massachusetts border. Oh. And the guy who founded it, his name was Rick, but I can't remember his last name. And he studied with Tom, somebody who was the person who passed on all the native teachings to people who were going to spread them. I don't remember. This was I, this sounds this the, this town person sounds that he do something like bird language. I, I don't know. Okay. Any case. But anyway, I I was going to say, but I really have no idea that maybe they do this for adults. You know, I was going to say to the whole group, um, but I don't. I just don't. You know, I just thought about we don't just live in four walls. I was surprised myself when I said we live with walls within walls. You know, we're we're so fenced off from it all, um, but. You know, that's when you talked about lying down. My, my daughter, not surprisingly, when if you go out for a walk with her, she'll just lie down on the earth on her back, any place, no tick protection, no clothing on practically. So you learn, you know, these are, she's my best teacher. She's my teacher, um, for sure. Uh, but anyway, Hawk Circle, you know, is one way for kids um, to have this experience and they learn tracking and recognizing animal prints and they build their own debris hut and you know all kinds of experiences and that's probably what set her on the path i was in someone's house when they were just babies practically and i saw that maybe they were five years old you know five and one and there's a little piece of paper this big on somebody's bulletin board in a house i'd never been and it described hawk circle like in one sentence and i wrote it down and years later i still had that piece of paper miracle of miracles and I investigated and they went there. Ricardo Sierra, that's his name. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, and the girls went there for two weeks, four weeks, by the time she was 15, she was doing a solo up in the mountains in Maine. I mean, she's done many things that could terrify me, but she tries to teach me that the universe provides. So, mm. yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. I wrote it down, and I will definitely look look yeah. it up and share with um, share with folks. Um, and what was your word? Your um, you had this word connection, and you said, but that's a philosophical word. Oh, relationship. Relationship. Yeah, she always talks about relationship too. 
but I always talk about myself as a connector, but it's relationship. I mean, you know, so I, I you know, they're just words. So it all depends on, you know, so, you know, I, I wouldn't hold that uh, or I didn't, I didn't mean to imply that like this yeah. word is wrong and this word is, you know, and right. Relationship is a richer word. Yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you. I'm hardly Jewish at all. Um, I feel more Buddhist than Jewish at this stage. Um, so that's why I kept bowing out. <laughs> um, I, but, but yeah, well, this has been a very wonderful experience. I don't have Jewish learning, you know, I brought up Jewish, but, um, but I just came to, to learn because anything about the earth and respect and love is up my alley. And we do all share her. So however much Buddhist, Jewish, Jubu, um, or, or any other person or tradition, I, this is our shared um, challenge, uh, threats, opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and Buddhism has, for me personally as well, a great, great amount to teach uh, about right relationship in general, uh, including with the earth. Um, so, uh, and I, there are more and more conversations between Jews and Buddhists about this, among other things. So I, uh, if this is the first one, I, I would not be surprised if, if you see more and more Jews and Buddhists and Buddhist Jews and Muslim mm -hmm. Jews and Catholic Buddhists and everyone else uh, coming together um, to learn from each other. Um, um, yeah, as one ecosystem. Thank you very That's much. We survive. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Jenna, is there anything that you want to share or ask? Um, wow, this has been so phenomenal. Everything you said just really hit home. I do everything I do so that I can live more connected to the earth. Um, it was just, it was so good to hear it all put to words. <laughs> just kind of been like listening in reverence, taken aback, writing a million things down, safely like they could while driving. <laughs> ah. I am I just parked. Here. Just parked. Mm. Well, thank you for coming. And if you ever want to share any any insights or anything about your life and work, uh, then please feel free to uh, to reach out. Do um, you think you could, could you circle back to what you were saying about our role as stewards? Because I don't think I heard or understood and I just was wondering if you would be willing to sure. recap that a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, so this is of course just my perspective, um, but I, um, so I bristle a little bit at, at um, folks talking about stewardship and it's actually, you know, I've been sort of criticizing and second guessing myself as I talked through this past hour, uh, whether I'm being nitpicky about language here. And I think the issue is actually not just language. It's, it's also, you know, what I see people practically doing when they talk about stewardship. So, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> It is too high vibrational. My phone cut you out after you said <laughs> your connection. All right. So I was saying things that are not important and I'm now coming to my point. So stewardship in my experience and in my thinking generally implies that people are thinking about how to ma manage the environment better, mm -hmm. um, which is a very, very positive step, hugely revolutionarily positive step. Um, from just, you know, fracking uh, everything to, uh, um, to death. However, it still uh, feels like a, uh, and seems like a, a relationship of control, just benevolent control. Um, and I wonder about, and I think our indigenous ancestors and indigenous folks around the world uh, have a relation, have a uh, dynamic uh, with the living world that is not stewardship, that it's not a, about just about control, it's about relationship. And some of that relationship does involve, you know, like good stewardship because my sense is, and, you know, please tell me it's very possible, you know, much more about this than I do. 
uh, is that we've actually been learning or realizing uh, in, or, or just hearing actually more in recent decades that indigenous people like never lived in just this like zero footprint kind of uh, relationship that they did manage uh, the ecosystems around them. They did intentional burnings. They were intentional about what they hunted and what they planted uh, from the Southwest to even, I've read some things about the Amazon that it's amazing richness and biodiversity um, that scientists think now did not just sort of happen naturally. It was because there were humans there that were intentional about what they were bringing in. So, so there was some management, um, but what I'm uh, trying to point to is, is management and stewardship is, is still a kind of controlled relationship and that there's something even more mm -hmm. intimate, which is relationship. Like, like I talk to you, like I listen to you, like I learn from you. And, and that does not mean, you know, with words like this, uh, but, you know, perhaps in other states of consciousness with feeling and other kinds of ways, um, but that's different relationship and, and we're on the same, you know, we're on a level plane or, or the reality is in lots of ways, the animals and the birds and the trees and the earth are, are actually more evolved than us. And in some ways we're more evolved than them. Um, so, so we're not maybe on a level relationship, but, but we're not just consistently sitting, um, somewhere on top. So that's a whole lot of words um for just yeah not con stewardship is still control and still feels like a form of colonization mm -hmm. um and relationship you know is a thing that that is radically different than that or at least more expansive yeah does that make sense it is because one is kind of like the white man's manifest destiny and the other yep. is an intimate partnership yep Hello? Yes, 